Hello, I'm Paul Beckwith, and unfortunately we have another week where we're going to be having uh, massive uh, hurricane damage. Um, this time it should be just in Florida, you know, not in the other states that uh, Helena, Hurricane Helena, went up into. So I want to talk about the uh, present situation and some of the, you know, incredible, unprecedented behavior of of uh, of Hurricane Milton. It went from tropical storm then to category one and it all it accelerated up to category five with a something like a 50 millibar pressure drop in the center of the storm in the space of um, about nine hours or so. So it's in the Gulf. It's got a very unusual path and uh, I'll talk about that, but there's also other storms churning in the uh, in the basin, the Atlantic, because of the, the water is so warm. So we've got um, Hurricane Milton right here. It's just grazing uh, the Yucatan Peninsula. We've got uh, Kirk over here which is heading over into Europe and it'll hit Europe on Wednesday. This is expected to land fall in Florida on Wednesday evening. And we've also got uh, big storm Leslie down here which has been meandering around in the ocean I think for something like 19 days and it's going to last at least another four days where it ends up who, who knows and I'll show you why its path is very erratic. And we've got a couple other ones here. This is looks like a fairly significant one and then a smaller one over here. So this is Earth Null School. So just click on Earth and uh, look at 250 millibar in order to get the uh, jet stream configuration. And, and you can look get the jet stream uh, configuration to see where the guidance is going to be on these um, tropical storms. So I focused in on the uh, Gulf of Mexico and you can see uh, Milton here. And if I just click to my next screen and click back, so this is a jet stream and this is Milton over here, Hurricane Milton. So what you can see is that the, you know, this is coming up here and it, it's expected to follow a path just right of, right something like that into central Florida. Now you can look at the jet stream and you can see it's extremely strong in this region. If I click on it, that's 144 kilometers an hour. You know, some of these streaks are even faster, 160 kilometers an hour. So uh, the guidance for Hurricane Milton looks like it's gonna come up here. Too bad it doesn't loop down here and miss Florida, but uh, you know, it's track is, all the models are showing it coming up here. You know, right now having almost a direct hit on Tampa. It's a, it's a category five now. It's expected to weaken as it comes in this area because of wind shear, which is different wind directions and speeds at different altitudes, which can tend to weaken and break up a storm. But, you know, if this thing comes up here and gets swept in these, in, in these high, Jet stream, guided and swept in these high jet stream winds, it could actually accelerate. And, you know, I don't, I would, you know, all the models are showing it, it'll end up being reduced to about a category three with tremendous storm surge still, still, because it's fairly compact and small. And as it weakens, it tends to um, get much larger in size. And uh, I'll talk about all the different factors that are involved in storm surge in a bit, but, um, yeah, this is this is a very un, and it's a very unusual situation because it's coming at Florida from the west, which is which is extremely rare for for these uh, storms. And also, it'll be almost perpendicular to the shore. It looks like, and this itself leads to problems. Um, so, you know, it's a bit of a catch twenty two because if it actually accelerates in speed. It has less time to weaken. It could hit as a category four or five, I think. And if it does slow down significantly and, and spread out and weaken, that gives it time to weaken to a category three and get much larger size. But then if it's going slower, its impact on the coast 
is greater. And of course, Florida is pretty thin here. So, you know, this is probably going to burn right across the uh, peninsula, and, you know, probably still staying a hurricane and then coming off into the uh, Atlantic on the other side. If we look at, um, if we look at uh, Kirk, Hur Hurricane Kirk, which is heading over to Europe, it's got an incredible path, almost unprecedented, you know, and it can sweep up and cut through Europe. So if we, it won't be a hurricane, it'll be tropical storm, but the winds are, will still be quite high when it sweeps up. So, so this is the um, motion at the surface, um, the rotation of Kirk, uh, also category five right now, I believe, very big storm. And then this is the jet streams that are guiding it. So, so uh, here's where we are right now. You can see how it's, you know, it is perturbing the, the jet stream, you know, we're, we're almost splitting into two branches, one north and one south. And, you know, it looks like here, you know, if it gets caught in these, you know, they're saying it's going to come off, come up here and hit Europe. I think they, they're saying it's going to take this path here and probably come here and loop up this path. I think that's what they're saying. But if it slows down and lingers and it gets caught in this, streak here of the jet stream, very high winds, 270 kilometers an hour. It can accelerate in speed and be carried further south and then and then at some point swing up. And, and so it could, uh, you know, it, its path, instead of hitting the UK, the English Channel, you know, it could actually hit further down because this is this is worth watching. It's a, it's a, it's expected to impact the Europe, uh, but at the same time that um, that Hurricane Milton uh, hits uh, Florida. Okay, so it's another one to watch. Leslie um, is here moving very slowly and it's out in the middle of the ocean, so it's not bothering anybody. It's still a, a powerful big storm. And you can see the jet streams here and, you know, they're all over, right? I mean, it's going up here, you know, but very weak. Uh, not very strong jet streams, and then if it comes up over in this region, it can meander around. There's not a lot of steering force at high altitudes um, at the height of the jet streams to move Leslie, so it's kind of meandering around. But still, it's just sort of fascinating that we've got all these storms and that their behaviors are quite different depending on the particular uh, jet stream configuration. So this is my Twitter. I still, you know, post videos once I post, once I film them and they're on YouTube, I post them on Twitter and, and, and uh, Facebook, my Facebook page, is the page, my page, my personal Facebook, also on LinkedIn, if you use LinkedIn and also on um, Reddit and uh, sometimes on, on uh, Instagram. But, you know, I need to expand to I, I really need to just do it. Just, you know, join all these other social media accounts and post on all of them. Take the extra time to post on all of them um, and see what happens because, uh, you know, the way Twitter slash X is going, um, it may not be around for that much longer. Um, I mean, the, the amount of misinformation on Twitter is, the, the signal to noise is, is getting much reduced on twi Twitter. The signal being, you know, reputable, good, uh, decent uh, posts versus the noise, the, the nonsense, um, that ratio is dropping significantly. And, you know, it reaches a point, you know, people will leave Twitter slash X in droves and find something else. Okay, so let's have a look on, you know, we do the search on X on Hurricane Milton. So it's a category five storm. It's got winds of 180 miles an hour. So it's tied as the third strongest hurricane in Atlantic history. Now, these winds, 180 miles per hour, th these, are, these are steady winds, okay? It's just got, had phenomenal growth today. Um, and uh, how big are these steady winds? Well, this is a Sapphire-Simpson hurricane scale. I went into Google Images and just uh, searched for it. And uh, basically, you know, category one is 74 to 95 miles per hour. Okay, so the delta here is 21 miles an hour. 
okay, the spread. Hurricane category two, hurricane 96 to 110, much smaller spread. And it's because it's mostly based on damage that's done. So it's kind of highly nonlinear as you move up to higher and higher wind speeds. Not much damage and suddenly just becomes devastating here. So 96 to 110, you have extensive damage. That's only a gap of 14 miles per hour. Then you go here, a gap of 18 miles an hour, devastating damage from 111 to 129 miles per hour. And from that's um, a gap of uh, 18 miles per hour. And then the spread here is 26. This is the largest spread in a category four. It's catastrophic. And then 157 plus is again catastrophic. So I would argue that we should have an upper end for category five because um, right now Hurricane um, Hurricane uh, Milton is 180 miles per hour, which is over 23 miles an hour faster than this spread, and there's gusts up to 200. So if steady wind, there's still a lot of warm water it's going through, so I think it's going to still get stronger still. So I'm arguing that we need to have a Category 6. We need to have Category 5 going, say, you know, 157 to 177 miles per hour or 157 to 180 miles per hour or something. And then category six being at say above, uh, you know, 180 miles per hour. I mean, that makes perfect sense to me. Um, and there were some calls to do that a few years ago. So, so if you look at the Wikipedia page on the Sapphire Simpson scale, it talks about the scale being uh, basically a damage scale, right? Uh, we're talking about, so to be a hurricane, a tropical cyclone has to have a one minute average maximum sustained winds at 10 meters above the ground, that's 33 feet above the surface, of at least 74 um, miles an hour, 74 miles an hour, okay? So it's gotta be sustained winds for, you know, one minute a one minute average. And that applies, I think, for all going up the scale. Okay, so they talk about the history of the scale developed in 71 by civil engineer Safir and meteorologist Simpson, thus the name Safir Simpson scale, um, introduced to the general public in 1973. Okay, so so let me just, so it talks about de great detail about different categories, category one, two, three, and four, and so on, and five. And then it has a section on proposed extent extensions. Okay, so this is interesting because it does talk about category six, which, I'm, which I think we really need for a storm like the one that's churning in the Gulf of Mexico now. Milton. So... After the powerful storm systems of the 2005 Atlantic hurricane season, as well as Hurricane Patricia, a few newspaper columnists, scientists, and myself, I was really pushing at the time for in the introduction of category six. So the suggestion was for pegging category six to storms with winds greater than 174 or 180 miles per hour. Fresh calls were made for consideration of Category 6 after Hurricane Irma a few years later in, uh, well, in 2017. Uh, some people called it Category 6, even though that category doesn't really exist. Many local politicians started using the term. Only a few storms of this intensity have ever been recorded. Okay, of the 41 hurricanes currently considered to have obtained Category 5 status in the Atlantic, 19 had wind speeds at 175 miles an hour or greater. Only eight had wind speeds at 180 miles per hour or greater. Okay, so probably 180 would be a category that makes sense. There's been other storms, typhoons in the Western Pacific, like the, these one in 79, 2019, 2023. 
they had sustained winds of 190 miles per hour. So there you go. They're well into category six if we were to generate such a uh, category scale. There's even typhoons um, that in the Pacific that had sustained winds of 195 miles per hour, which is 315 kilometers an hour. Okay, so as because as climate is warming, you know, we're getting more and more storms. So, so, so here's a suggestion, NOAA research scientist. He said the potential for more intense hurricanes was increasing. He suggested that category six would begin at 195 miles per hour, but that category seven beginning at 230, you know, hypothetical, not happening yet. Okay, so yeah, if we're going to bring a category six in with a, you know, say at 180, we should definitely also call, bring in a category seven at say uh, 200 miles per hour or something like that. You know, when you get winds in excess of 155 miles an hour, you have enough damage. If that extreme wind sustains itself for as much as six seconds on a building, it's going to destroy the building. So, you know, these numbers are all sustainable winds for um, a minute like I said. Okay, so lots to think about. And I'll talk about storm surge in a bit. Okay, so let's just have a look at some of the other. Um, I have refreshed this. I'm filming this about just before 9pm on Monday, uh, October 7th just so that you know, you know, that the, the stuff is up to date from then. Just go on Twitter and do the search on Hurricane Milton category and you can uh, see the latest. The pressure dropped below 900 millibars. So this is in the last 40 minutes, central pressure of 897 millibar, making it the fifth most intense hurricane in Atlantic history by central pressure. 180 miles per hour, gusts of 225 miles per hour. This is this is a beast now. Look at the structure. You would al almost say it's a you know an instrument. You know you can almost see the 3D structure here. It's like you're looking looking down through through the uh, bands of clouds to the uh, eye there, compact eye. Um, so yeah, it, it, the track is still through central Florida with large storm surge um, all up the coast. You know, but very large where near near where it hits. It was Cat One for it, it intensified to Category Five from Cat One. It says in only eleven hours. I thought it was you know it dropped fifty millibar in nine hours. I think gaining power at a rate of about five hundred terawatt, which is uh, you know five hundred and a whole bunch of zeros. I guess that's 12 zeros and that's in joules per second is a watt. This is equal to scale, equal in scale to Earth's energy imbalance, the rate at which our planet is warming. Huge amount of, of increase in speed. You know, there's another, there's images all over the web on this guy. Um, some of the models show that the eye never fills in. It makes it all the way across Florida to Cape Canaveral. Tampa Bay is under huge threat, 10 to 15 feet of storm surge, right? And so here is some of the models. Let's just have a look at this. So this is Thursday, 9 and 10. Look, it's still got an eye as it goes out into the Atlantic over here. So Wednesday, 11, 2 a.m. on Thursday, it, it impacts and uh, moves across. So this is what the model is showing, um, right? That the eye stays intact and it chews up, uh, you know, Florida basically. Okay, let's keep going. Yeah, a lot of people are talking about the intensification. And I, let me play this because this is a very uh, compelling track. It's just an incredible, incredible, incredible hurricane. Uh, it has dropped. Okay, let me turn up the volume. It's, it's, it's just an incredible. Okay, because you don't see this uh, very often from uh, weather reporters, right? They beat, especially one who's been in the industry for so long. I'm just turning the volume up. And uh, let's play this for you. 
just an incredible, incredible, incredible hurricane. Uh, it has dropped. It has dropped 50 millibars in 10 hours. Um, I apologize. This is just horrific. Um, winds at maximum sustained winds are 160 miles per hour. And uh, another 180. It, uh, it is just uh, gaining strength in the Gulf of Mexico, where you can imagine uh, the winds, I mean, the seas are just so incredibly, incredibly hot, uh, record hot, as you might imagine. You know what's driving that. I don't need to tell you. Global warming, climate change uh, leading to this and becoming an increasing threat uh, for uh, Yucatan, uh, including Merida and Progreso and other areas there. Uh, let's see if I can show you um, the latest. Uh, there's the Cat 5 information. Uh, winds 160 miles per hour. Uh, moving east southeast at 9 miles per hour. Okay, like I said, it's and, 180 uh, already now. Uh, on that track, you're going to notice that this system is going to come very, very close uh, to uh, the Yucatan. And the dirty side of this hurricane, folks, is on the right hand side of its progress. Um, it's like a buzzsaw, so right? If you think of the rotation, uh, these uh, speed added to the forward uh, speed, the uh, right quadrant is the one that has the most uh, damage, the most surge. Nothing else but that. So it's going to be very tough. Now let's transition to Florida uh, because even though it is expected to weaken on approach, it is so incredibly strong right now that. Um, you're going to find it very difficult for it to be nothing less than a major hurricane when it makes landfall in Florida. Okay, so very, um, very emotional uh, display there. Okay, so just an incredible. I'm not sure if, if you got the sound hurricane. on that. I hope uh, it I hope it turned out, but. It's all on, yeah, it's, uh, let me go down, go back. Okay, so this is meteorologist John Morales TV is his, uh, his X slash Twitter. He's a certified consulting meteorologist, a hurricane specialist, a columnist. Um, and uh, yeah, he's, uh, I think he's based in Florida now. Okay, uh, space station images, you know, are just incredible of the size of this storm and the wind speeds and so on can be measured also from space. Okay, now parts of Florida, of course, still are piled up with debris from Hurricane Helene, which hasn't, you know, it's just been pushed off the side of the road, but it's, you know, piles and piles of debris and rubbish. I hope they're recycling some as much as they can of this. I have a feeling most of it just gets, they, 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 they just give up and just dump it all in dumpsters and haul it away to, to, uh, to landfills, I'm guessing. I mean, but you know, why wouldn't they recycle the metals and things like that? Um, radar view versus window view from the NOAA Aircraft Operations Center. So these are the radar views. And uh, Doppler radars, etc. I, I want to see the window view. Is that is it coming? There we go. The window view. Can't see too much. <laughs> anyway, incredible. Lot, all kinds of images on on Milton. And uh, let's see. <laughs> Here's another image of what it's expected to do. Just go on a straight path and then cross Florida. So, but like, you know, as I was showing you the jet streams, I mean, up here the jet streams are maximized and they're a bit weaker down here. So that could, um, depending on, you know, what its path, uh, you know, this, this line, if it's a little bit farther north, it's going to have higher forward speed. A little bit further south, it'll have slower forward speed. It's got its rotation speed churning this way, so the storm surge is going to be worst on the right. 
So uh, we've also got um, Hurricane Kirk um, is actually quite amazing. So in the Atlantic Basin, for the first time on record, three hurricanes, Kirk, Leslie and Milton, are spinning simultaneously in the month of October. From the warm confines of the Western Gulf to the endless horizons of the Northern Atlantic seas, it seems that 2024 hurricane season has unfortunately hit its peak. And there's a satellite image of, uh, you know, the different storm systems. And uh, this is a really good quote. In due course, probably in my lifetime, we will witness a weather event so awesome, so destructive, so evidently outside of the realm of normality that it will wait even the most hardened denialists with a jolt. The problem is that its occurrence will also signal that we've left it far too late to act. That's James Hansen. Um, I think from what we've seen in the last few years, I don't think anything will wake even the most hardened denialist. I think there, nothing will ever change their mind. That's, that's my opinion. Nothing. Um, this is the, uh, there's, there's some, let's see if we can see some more images. Uh, I thought there were some movies. This is Kirk coming to Europe. And, uh, okay, so there's stuff there. Let me do a refresh here. I thought there was more. Oh, that's just a post. Uh, I'm looking, I gotta back, back up. That's my problem. Back, Hurricane Kirk. Yeah, so here it is. Here's its expected path. Um, of course, that could change, but it's gonna hit roughly is the time here yes so it's going to hit a little bit earlier than um hurricane milton you know it'll drop from a hurricane to a very strong tropical storm with powerful winds cutting through france impacting the english channel london Britain and going right up towards uh, through Germany. Okay, re remarkable. I've never seen a national hurricane center cone extend into Germany and Denmark. This is a meteorology student at Rutgers. Okay, so the cones extending into Germany, through France, into uh, Germany and uh, Denmark. Okay, so it shows you the models and the paths and so on. <coughs> okay, and uh, what is this one? This is Hurricane Kirk again. There we go. Oh, it shows you what, what it did. Look what it did. It did a loop the loop. So you can see, you know, you can see the reason why these, these storms move as they do. Just bring up the jet streams on Earth Null School and look at the jet streams because the get the jet streams, you know, guide these storms and control their, their translation speed and so on. So Okay, so uh and then of course we have another one. We have Hurricane Leslie. You know, Hurricane Leslie is, uh, this is Leslie. <laughs> it's a storm that doesn't want to die. It's been roaming around the Atlantic Ocean. You know, this is, this is uh, an old post. Okay, you have to be careful, <laughs> right? Like I said, misinformation on Twitter. It's, it says October 11th, 2018. There was another Leslie and it was looping around. So I guess, you know, like they call Leslie's the one that loops around. Oh, well, look at this. Yeah, here's a, here's a projection for Leslie that it goes this way and then turns around and becomes a category eight or nine over here. Well, I don't think that uh, is correct. I mean, this is this. Remember when Trump was waving his arms and with a marker on one of these plots? Well, maybe he's he's the guy behind this. I don't know. OK, so anyway, you get the picture. These these massive storms are. Um, 
affecting things. Uh, Florida hurricane was a search and there's lots of stuff about the preparations and so on. You know, if you go to the latest stuff, there's a lot of utter nonsense um, and uh, fake news about these storms. Um, some good information, but you have to know something about it. You, if you try to learn from this, if you try to learn completely from this, you'll get a lot of misinformation. And then, of course, uh, I did Tampa. So, you know, Tampa's right in the, in the, in the line, projected line. This was a storm that went through Tampa in 1848, the probable track of, of a hurricane that went through Tampa. These things are extremely rare coming up this way and hitting almost orthogonal or perpendicular to the, to the surface. Um, people are evacuating traffic, heavy traffic out of, out of the regions. Um, lots of debris, which is still there. That'll be picked up by storm surges, et cetera. Yeah, and, and the models are still projecting, you know, that it'll lower to a high-end Cat 3 by the time it impacts Florida, but I'm really not sure on that. I would call that it'll be higher than that. It'll be 4 or maybe even still 5. That would be my guess based on the steering winds and the warm temperatures, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Uh, Tampa, here's some uh, updates on... You know, there's potential impacts from the different winds, you know, uh, wind threat category 4321, etc. cetera. Um, storm surge threats, flooding rains, and key messages, you know, with storm surge is really high here. Okay, so there's lots of information. I talked about the Sapphire Simpson scale. This you know, this hurricane in the Gulf could actually be, would be a category six if there was a category defined. Um, and storm surge, I want to talk a bit about storm surge because that's going to cause tremendous damage um, if this thing is category three or higher. So storm surge, it's also called a storm flood, a tidal surge or a storm tide. It's not really a tidal surge. Anyways, a coastal flood or tsunami-like phenomena of rising water associated with low pressure weather systems like cyclones. It's measured as a rise in water level above the normal tide level. It doesn't include waves. Okay, so the main factor, the main weather factor that contributes to a large storm surge, it's high speed winds pushing the water towards the coast over a long fetch. So the winds are blowing over a long distance. Now we certainly have that in the Gulf of Mexico, a long fetch. Other factors include the shallowness and orientation of the water body. So the water is very shallow where it's expected to hit. The orientation is coming in perpendicular. The timing of tides, you know, it's supposed to hit at um, late Wednesday night. So what's the tide? Is it going to hit at a high tide? The effect will be even worse or will it hit at a low tide when the effect will be mitigated a little bit the atmospheric pressure drop due to the storm right and and uh it's gone below 900 millibars right now so okay so these the effects are broken down so the direct wind effect is a key the key effect right wind stress pushes the water water levels tend to increase downwind of the um, wind, the shores that the wind is blowing onto, and decrease at the upwind shores. Intuitively, this is caused by the storm blowing the water towards one side of the basin in the direction of the winds. Strong surface winds cause surface currents at a 45 degree angle to the wind direction. This effect is known as the Ekman spiral, because the Ekman spiral effects spread vertically through the water. The effect is proportional to depth depth, the angle. The surge will be driven into bays in the same way as the astronomical tide. Now the pressure effect is also easy to th conceptualize and think of. So low pressure, low atmospheric pressure above the water, the water rises upwards to counteract the low pressure. So the, the total pressure at some plane beneath the water surface remains constant. So the effect is basically 
we have a 10 millimeter or 0.39 inch increase in sea level for every millibar or hexapascal, one millibar equals one hexapascal drop in atmospheric pressure. So this major storm, instead of you know nominal atmospheric pressure of 1013 millibar, it's reached 897 millibar at the moment. So that's um, 116 millibars below atmospheric. Okay, so that would be 1.16 meters or 3.3, you know, 3.3, 3.4 feet of water level rise just from the pressure, low pressure effect of the storm alone. Now, the effect of the Earth's rotation is also important, right? The Coriolis force effect, it bends anything moving, it bends to the right in the northern hemisphere, to the left in the southern hemisphere. So when this bend brings the current into more perpendicular contact with the shore, it can amplify the surge. When it bends the current away from the shore, it has the effect of lessening the surge. And then the effect of waves, right? Powerful winds whip up large, strong waves in its direction of movement. These surface waves are responsible for very little water transport in open water, but near the shore where it's shallowing up, they take water, a lot more water towards the shore. So waves, when the waves are breaking on a line more or less parallel to the beach, they consider, they carry considerable water shoreward. And this is the case that we expect with Hurricane Milton. Okay, as they break, the wave moving towards the shore has considerable momentum may run up a sloping beach to an elevation above the main water line, which may exceed twice the wave height before breaking. Okay, so think of these waves on top of the storm surge, carrying water even further inland. There's also the rainfall effect, and that happens in estuaries or coves, right? So this is an estuary. It's where rivers and streams go into the ocean. Hurricanes may dump as much as you know, 12 inches, 300 millimeters of rainfall in 24 hours, even more with the recent storms. So surface runoffs can quickly flood the streams. That increases the water level near the head of the estuary where the river enters the ocean. And that also can raise the, uh, has have an effect of raising the storm surge. And then of course, the depth of the ocean and the topography on the coastline is important. Okay, so if it's a narrow continental shelf with deep water close to the shoreline, then storm surges are lower, but the waves are higher and more powerful. If you have a wide continental shelf like that off the west coast of Florida, the Florida shelf, the water's shallower, so th there tends to be a higher storm surge with relatively smaller waves. And they give a couple examples. They give Palm Beach on the southeast coast of Florida, where, which is the first case where it's a narrow shelf. On the Gulf side of Florida, the edge of the Floridian Plateau can lie more than 160 kilometers or about 100 miles offshore. So Florida Bay, for example, is very shallow, water depths of only you know, a foot to six feet. So there's much higher storm surges on the, um, the Gulf side. Okay, uh, the difference is due to how much flow area the storm surge can dissipate to. So in deeper water, there's more area and space for the surge to be dispersed to. And in shallow, gently sloping shelves, you run out of real estate, basically. The water is forced up, it has nowhere to go. So the topography and the topography of the land is also important, right? Florida is very, you know, lots of land is just very close to sea level and very flat. So this is a problem. The size of the storm is also important. It affects the surge, storm surge. This is due to the storm's area. If you think of the area of the storm, it's not proportional to the perimeter, right? If a storm doubles in diameter, the perimeter is just pi times diameter. So the perimeter also doubles, but the area is pi r squared or pi d squared over four where d is the diameter, so it's area, the area quadruples if d doubles. Okay, so as there's proportionally less perimeter of the storm for the surge to dissipate to, the store, surge height ends up being higher. So here's the catch-22, which I mentioned earlier. You know, if Hurricane, um, if Hurricane Milton 
uh, stays category four, category five, and hits wind damage horrendous. You know, storm surge horrendous, but confined to the smaller area. If it weakens to category three, then the storm gets much much larger in size, and the much larger size still gives it a very very large storm surge because of this effect, right? So you know, you can't you can't win on this one. Um, it talks. There's a model called the Slosh model. The U.S. National Hurricane Center forecasts storm surge using the Slosh model. It stands for sea, lake, and overland surges from hurricanes. It's accurate to within about 20%. So I haven't seen results from this yet, um, but this is an example of a uh, run and the storm surge that is um, carried inland. And it's mostly, you'll notice here, the storm it will actually be spinning this way. So the storm surge is the highest over here in the right quadrant, the right front quadrant of the storm. Because the, the wind speed there is the forward speed of the whole system plus the rotation speed. Whereas over on this side, the winds would be the forward speed minus the rotation speed because the rotation is it would be the opposite direction to the motion. Okay, so this is what we have. So now I just want to, we can't forget about Helene, you know, damage estimates are maybe approaching 200 billion. And there's a lot of nonsense going on um, there's a lot of stuff being said by certain politicians, uh, lies basically, or just ignorance, simple lack of knowledge, and you know people take them and run with them in certain political groups. So this is a, a, a huge problem, um, and you know the politicization of Hurricane Helene going strong, um, and you know I find that the top. Um, stories are, have generally more validity. Um, breaking, FEMA has provided all of the following to Hurricane Helene victims to date, 210 million in federal assistance and so on. So he's saying, shut the hell up already. That's the people who are saying that, you know, some people are arguing that FEMA stopped people from being rescued. And, you know, there's so much misinformation out about, about FEMA you know, untruths and so on. Um, and I'll show you their web page in a second. We haven't, power hasn't been restored everywhere from Hurricane Helene. Okay, so this is electrical customers without power. Um, there's still about 200,000 people without power. You know, Florida, everybody's got power right now. We'll see what that map goes to. You know, the whole state, I think, could lose power quite conceivably. The whole grid can collapse. I think, uh, you know, uh, there might not be this, there, there might be, you know, very tiny blue areas where the power is not out, you know, up here, maybe, maybe some areas, I doubt it down here. It depends on where the power stations are. And uh, yeah, it's going to be, it's going to be, going to be uh, bad and it, you know, could be as costly or even more costly than Hurricane Helene, but all in one state as opposed to distributed all the way up. Okay, so I'm sick and tired of this crap. Officials debunk Trump's truly dangerous Hurricane Helene lies. Okay, so Trump's pushed lies about immigrants since at least 2015. So when a hurricane devastated large swaths of the southeast last month, killing over 200 people, he tried to blame the disaster on Democrats and undocumented immigrants. There you go. He's saying that, uh, you know, the color of the state, who they voted for, affected relief. You know, I mean, even, you know, main, I mean, people from all different sources and places and knowledge are saying it's just a barrage of lies and distortions. Um, and just blame, blame, blame. And when he was fact-checked, he just changed his lie. He said that um, the money's going to... Im he, he said that the money is going to uh, immigrants and not to uh, the uh, the FEMA. He says that they stole money from the FEMA bank, just like they stole it from a bank. <laughs> um, there was a program that it provides grants to help local governments, but it's not the same pools of money, but it's the same agency. So. 
The only reported case of money being pulled from FEMA to cover the cost of housing and detaining immigrants well, was in 2019 when Trump was president. They yanked $271 million from the Department of Homeland Security, including $155 million from FEMA's Disaster Relief Fund to address a surge in asylum applications. So there, there you go. <laughs> right? Whatever you say, accuse the other side of, you do yourself. I mean, you know, there, there's claims of, you know, like it's just, it's just absurd, the nonsense, the misinformation. Uh, makes you really wonder whether democracy has any chance in, in the U.S. at all. Fact-checking falsehoods about FEMA funding, right? It sort of, it talks about, more about this sort of stuff. You know, the polarization, the politicization, it's, you know, so these questions are all asked. And a lot of the responses come directly from the FEMA website. So Hurricane Helene, rumor responses. Rumor, FEMA only provides loans to disaster survivors. False. The grants do not have to be paid back in, in, in most cases. Right? Applying multiple times for disaster assistance will speed up the process. Nope. You know, we're in a digital age, digital equipment, computers, databases. I think the they can figure out if somebody applies multiple times. Maybe maybe delay assistance if they keep applying because they're trying to game the system. You know, and there's lots of other stuff here. Um, so there's all these different rumors and they provide the facts plus often links to the facts and they keep adding this on a daily basis. I mean, this is what we're up to. Just leave them alone and let this disaster relief occur. But I mean, this is the sort of thing that we can expect to happen, probably even at an amplified, worsened scale in Florida. And if Florida is, you know, completely devastated, which it looks like it's that's going to happen in a few days, then um, this is just going to going to be going to be crazy stuff. Anyway, thanks for listening. Uh, please. Go to my website, paulbeckwith.net, and donate to PayPal to support my research and videos. Thanks again, and uh, bye for now. Oh, uh, heads up. Um, I, I'm going to, I'm three quarters of the way through the climate book by Greta, and I'll do a book review on that uh, shortly after I finish it. Also came across this paper on the Earth's sea ice radiative effect from 1980 to 2023. It's how the Earth is reflecting a lot less solar radiation as the sea ice declines. And, uh, you know, I'll talk about this fairly recent paper. And uh, I'll also talk about the snow cover because the, de excuse me, declining snow cover in the northern hemisphere is having just as large an effect until recently as the sea ice lots of sea ice is. Is that still valid? I have to check that and see. Okay, well, thanks again for listening. And again, please go to my paulbeckwith.net and donate to my PayPal. Apologize. Um, Newton's uh, fast asleep uh, on the bed and uh, curled up with uh, Sally, who's also fast asleep on the bed. So I didn't have, I didn't want to <laughs> go and disturb either of them to, uh, you know, have cameos on this uh, video. So maybe next time. Okay, thanks again, and uh, bye for now.